chemicals versus RTDs. You know, every day we use temperature in one way or another, and I don't know if you've been watching the Olympics, but uh, temperature plays a part in every every game. And, uh, you know, if we stop looking at measurement, we can measure it accurately. And if we can measure it accurately, we can save ourselves money and we can make money. And in this industry, making money and saving money is what it's all about. So uh, hopefully we can learn something out of this and to help us avoid some of the pitfalls when it comes to improper selection of RTDs or thermocouples or the improper wiring. Now some of the slides as we go through them will be great to download if you have the ability to download them during this presentation. If you don't have that ability, it's going to be saved. Uh, this whole broadcast will be saved so you'll be able to go back and download it later for future reference. Now, let's get started. Here's the agenda. This is what we'll be going over. And again, if you have any questions, key it into the chat log, and we'll discuss it at the end of this presentation. Bill? All right. Well, first off, we're just going to start off and, and define what RTDs and thermocouples are and look at the, the very basics of each and how they function. First off, the thermocouple is nothing more than just two dissimilar metal wires that are connected together. And through a physical property of when you connect those together, there's a voltage generated. And when you change the temperature of that junction, the voltage changes. And it does so in a very predictable manner. Um, Typically, the, the voltage is going to be real small, somewhere between 5 and 6 millivolts at 100 degrees C. As the temperature goes down, that voltage drops, and as you go up, that voltage increases. So you can measure that and relate that to a corresponding temperature. Now, Bill, as we talk about thermocouples and these two dissimilar wires, these wires break down over time. They do, yes. And so the longevity of a thermocouple uh, it really starts to deplete from the day it's fabricated. Do you agree? It, it does. And, you know, the higher the temperature it's used at and also the type of atmosphere that it's in can affect its accuracy. Um, mostly it's due to contamination of those two metals that are used. That, that can lead to temperature drift and some other, some other bad things. So. Okay. And there are two different types of thermocouples. You have the grounded thermocouple versus the ungrounded. The grounded junctions are used for tip-sensitive applications. An ungrounded junction is used when you need to isolate the junction from stray voltage, static charges, or, you know, bad ground loops, uh, cause for erratic errors. Right. The, the, the grounded junction, the way that's made is it's actually just tied right into the very tip of the sensor sheath. And the ungrounded is isolated from that metal sheath. Now, the old-time thermocouples that we've seen in the past where you've got the, just the two wires twisted together and you may have some sort of ceramic lining going over it, would that be an ungrounded thermocouple? Well, it would depend on what kind of thermal well you put it in. If you ah. dropped it into just a protection tube and the junction hit the bottom, it would be grounded. Ah, so it depends on the protection tube more than the wiring itself. Yeah, if it's just grounded to the, the, the tube that's protecting it, then it's a grounded junction. Ah, very good. Some of the more Here. common common. Go right ahead. Oh, some of the more common types of thermocouples. We've got the uh, the type T, J, E, and K, and those are the ones that that you'll see the most of. They can be identified by the lead wire colors, and you can see where we've got type T is red and blue, and and so forth. The negative lead is always red. And some of the uh, other less common types that are used at high temperatures would be the R, S, B, which are platinum, platinum, rhodium wires. And for extremely high temperatures, uh, tungsten and tungsten rhenium are the two conductors. Each of these has its own 
temperature um, characteristics, temperature versus voltage characteristics, and they're all designed to operate in various applications. For example, a type J thermocouple, if you use that in an oxidizing atmosphere at high temperatures, the iron conductor, of course, is going to rust real fast and it's going to drift and you're not going to get a very good temperature reading. And a little field note here, if you're out you know, digging around in an old thermocouple somewhere and you're trying to figure out what it is, go right back to this wire covering. You know, that, that's it's going to be the telltale of what you have in your application. And an interesting note here is you need, if your thermocouple is a type T thermocouple, the sensor itself, that needs to be tight T thermocouple wire all the way back. Another downfall with thermocouples, that can be an expensive run of wire. Mm -hmm. You know, another way to identify these, if, if the lead wire insulation is missing or too dirty to really tell, like a type J, one of those conductors is going to be iron, and so it's going to be highly magnetic. And so you can just tell real quick if one of those is really magnetic that it's a type J. Excellent. And here we have, if anybody out there has the ability to download a screen, this is a great one to download, print out, or to come back and get later. It basically shows you with a thermocouple, the different thermocouples and what ranges they cover. A very important chart when it comes to selecting the proper thermocouple. Performance of these is governed by a couple different um, standards. One is the ASTM E230, which defines the accuracy as special or standard limits of error. The special limits, um, well, it, actually, I think the next screen shows a table of these accuracies, and we'll take some time looking at that. Typically, uh, performance is, is uh, defined by well, the standard and then also how the, the thermocouple is constructed. The, the type K, for example, uses an Inconel 600 sheath in an ideal situation. You will see some of those that are built with 304, maybe 316 stainless. The best material, though, for the temperature range is Inconel 600. And that's to protect the thermocouple wires from contamination at the higher temperatures. And the other thing that will affect performance is the wire size. And if you use a larger wire size, it's going to drift less at the higher temperatures. And construction techniques to, to make sure that it's protected properly, a compressed um, ceramic insulation is really what's ideal to protect these thermocouples. And there's even some that are used at higher temperatures where you may have an inert gas purge to further protect the wires from any kind of oxidi oxidizing or reducing atmospheres. Bill, this particular screen shows us accuracy levels and uh, you know another screen that could be downloaded for future reference uh, by those observing this. But my question, I guess, comes from if you have a solid wired thermocouple, should you run solid wire, for instance, a 20-gauge thermocouple, solid? So you, you run that same type of wire all the way back, being solid wire as opposed to stranded, or does it make any difference when it comes to accuracy? You know, the solid wire will have um, less of a problem with uh, drift and maybe be a little more accurate. You know, you'd use the stranded wire where you want some flexibility, where the, you know, the the sensor might be on something that moves a little bit and you need to run from there back to a, a panel or an indicator or something. You'd want to use stranded wire so it's got a little more flexibility. Because as soon as you start flexing solid conductors, for example, they work hardened and that's going to change the accuracy of the thermocouple. And the, the stranded wires are a little less susceptible to that. Very good.